Uh, welcome to AADB's teleseminar entitled The Current State of Teledentistry. Uh, my name is Richard Hetke and I serve as the Executive Director of the American Association of Dental Boards and thanks to everybody for dialing into the program today. I hope you enjoy it. Um, we kicked off the AADB teleseminar program in 2017 with three seminars and we hope to do four programs this year with today's program being our first in 2018. And before we get started, just a few ground rules. Uh, all of the audience phones are in listen-only mode to avoid interruptions and to uh, avoid interference. Uh, to submit a question for consideration during this program, please email your question to AADB staff member Donna Adler. And Donna's email address, I think it's been in, in the promotional flyers, but I'll give them to you again. Donna's email address is D-A-D-L-E-R, that's just her first initial in Adler, D-A-D-L-E-R, at dentalboards.org. Dentalboards, all one word, with an S at the end, dot org. D-A-D-L-E-R at dentalboards.org. Um, and as I said, this program will be placed onto our AADB website as a podcast so that other members uh, can access the program, um, and we should have it on within about two weeks. Uh, we'll run today for about 60 minutes. I'd like to keep a hard stop at 1 o'clock Central Time. Um, our speaker, uh, who I'm going to introduce shortly, will present for about 40 minutes. We'll allow 20 minutes for Q&A. And any questions that aren't answered during the program, um, our speaker will follow up with a call or an email. So that's about it for the ground rules. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Bruce Seidberg. Uh, Dr. Seidberg practices dentistry in Liverpool, New York, which is a Syracuse suburb. He specializes in endodontics. Bruce has been practicing dentistry for 55 years and serves as a consultant and a lecturer on endodontics, general dentistry, legal and malpractice issues, and risk prevention. Uh, he's a diplomat to the American Association of Endodontics, the American Board of Legal Medicine, and the American Board of Forensic Dentistry and he's a fellow at the American Association of Hospital Dentists, the American College of Legal Medicine, the Pierre Pochard Academy, the American College of Dentists, and the American College of Forensic Examiners. Bruce maintains a number of professional organizational memberships, including the American Dental Association, the New York State Dental Association, the American Association of Endodontics, the American Association of Hospital Dentists, and our very own American Association of Dental Boards. Uh, he's licensed to practice in both New York and Massachusetts. Bruce took his DDS from SUNY Buffalo School of Dentistry and his Master of Science in Dentistry from Boston University School of Dentistry. And uh, he also picked up a law degree, so he's a busy guy. With that introduction, I give you Dr. Seidberg. Thank you, Richard. Welcome to the first AADB Teledentistry webinar of the 2018 series, and thank you all for giving your time to participate. I'm usually running around a room in front of a PowerPoint, so this is a, uh, a new adventure for, uh, for, for me, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing a procedure that's been around for several years and is now beginning to gain favor within the dental profession to improve access to care at a reduced, care, uh, reduced cost of care, and it's applicable to all phases of dentistry. There may be some repetitive comments for emphasis purposes only. There will be time for your questions, as you were just informed. Dentistry has seen extensive technological innovations in recent years. Many of you are using the CAD CAM technology to make computer-generated prosthetic restorations in your offices. Others are using CBCT, three-dimension radiographic systems. Some are using rotary instruments for endodontics. Lasers have been introduced as well, as there is a whole myriad of instruments and methods that have improved the delivery systems in dentistry and have made it a fun profession to be in. So let's take it another step further. We know that EKGs are being transmitted electronically in medicine and radiographic studies are shared across borders. Why not have a method in dentistry to help ease the access to care situation and make dentistry available for more of the population at the same time cut the cost of health care? We do have it. It's called teledentistry, which is in reality an alternative method to deliver existing dental services. Teledentistry is akin to telemedicine 
and the two terms are used interchangeably even though they are two different professions represented. It's also referred to as telehealth, as I will be doing from time to time today. It is the use of information-based technologies and communication systems to deliver health care across geographic distances. Teledentistry is a combination of telecommunications and dentistry involving the exchange of clinical information and images over remote distances for consultation and treatment planning. The origin is linked to a 1994 military project of the Army aiming to improve patient care, patient education, and effectuation of communication between dentists and dental labs. Findings were that of reduced care costs, extended care to distant and rural areas, and offering complete information for deeper analysis of dental problems. In 2004, Arizona passed legislation allowing qualified dental hygienists to enter into an affiliated practice relationship with a dentist to provide oral health care services for underserved populations without general or direct supervision in public health settings. In 2006, the Eastman Department of Dentistry at the University of Rochester in New York did a teledentistry project in six inner city elementary schools and seven child care centers. They screened 173 children, revealing that almost 40% aged 12 to 48 months had active dental caries. The 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act called for mid-level dental health care providers to work in underserved areas with underserved populations. In 2013, the Pew Charitable Trust study found nearly 16 million low-income children went without dental care, resulting in 215,000 children admitted to emergency rooms for otherwise preventable dental issues, costing more than $104 million. An ADA study in 2014 found that ER visits cost the U.S. health care system $1.6 billion with an average cost of $749 per visit. At year-end in 2016, approximately 212 million Americans, or 66% of the population, had dental benefits, leaving a staggering 34% with no coverage. The lack of dental insurance leads to missed dental care and can inhibit necessary prevention treatment, such as sealants, oral hygiene, education, and fluoride. Missed preventative treatment can lead to dental emergencies as nearly 738,000 Americans visit the emergency room for dental pain each year. And in 2016, the ER costs increased to over $2 billion. Emergency room visits usually involve the same patients seeking the same or additional care. They return to the ER because of inappropriate treatment. ER doctors will prescribe pain medications, but they do nothing for the underlying cause because they are not dentists. The patients are seeking the wrong service in the wrong setting at the wrong time. They return also because they either cannot find a nearby dentist or cannot afford to follow up on what's needed. Think about it. If the ER had the ability to connect with a dentist through teledentistry, as it does with cardiology and radiology through telemedicine, the ER costs would decrease and the patient would be exposed to the appropriate treatment. Lack of care can be equated to difficulty for access to care and could lead to potential dental emergencies. As a result, dental disease is not being diagnosed and treated appropriately. Prevention is the name of the game. Teledentistry can provide critical services where gaps currently exist especially for treatment planning and specialty consultations. Teledentistry is the future for dentistry, and because of what it accomplishes, it is needed and has to be recognized as a viable phase of dentistry. Teledentistry allows patients to have preventative services completed on-site through a variety of technologies. It is similar to being in a bricks-and-mortar office, except the dentist may be on a computer screen in a distant location instead of in person next to the patient. Teledentistry is an expansion beyond the physical limitations of a traditional dental practice. It is in a remote connection between the patient and the dentist without the removal of a human element. Access to care and practice revenues can be increased without the cost of adding more dental operatories and equipment. The ADA Council on Dental Practice defined teledentistry not as a service, 
but it's a method by which services are delivered. The ADA House of Delegates resolution addressed what patients can accept when receiving services via teledentistry, as well as the patient's rights, workforce, license, and payment issues. The policy statement stated that the provision of services using technologies needs to be properly documented, and that requirement created the need for a unique CDT code. The challenge we now face is how to help more people who need it and help cut costs of care delivery. Preparing for the influx of elderly patients and a growing global middle class wanting to improve quality of care and reduce costs of care is a big goal. Using technology to give patients follow-up care instructions and streamline patient self-care is only one simple example, and more will be discussed in a moment. So basically, the scope of teledentistry is to improve access to oral care, improve delivery of care at reduced costs, and eliminate disparities in oral care between rural and urban communities. The traditional paradigm of treating patients almost solely in the private dental practice setting is not capable of addressing Americans' unmet oral health care needs. Teledentistry, as previously stated, is where professionals treat patients across great distances using electronic communications. Information can be tr transmitted to a licensed dentist off-site for evaluation, but its usage is limited by occupational licensing. One significant barrier is obtaining licenses from each state in which the current or potential patients are or may be located. There are other barriers as well. The best option is to eliminate government licensing for dental professionals, and the goal of total portability is there. State licensing boards rarely place interests of dentists ahead of patient state safety, but it does happen. Putting states' rights aside, developing a national telemedicine-type license would certainly be to the best interest and safety of the patient. A second option is to redefine the location of interaction between patients and doctors from that of the patient to that of the doctor. Digital patients would be no different than those patients who travel across straight state lines for care. The doctor would then only need one license and would be responsible to only one set of licensing laws, that of their home state. The third option is for states with reciprocal agreements to honor each other's license, a formation of a dental compact, if you will, or expand reciprocity agreements. Eleven pieces of legislation in nine states take effect in 2018, ranging from requirements for establishing a professional relationship by a teledentistry, classifying tel telehealth visits as a means of alternative access standards, requirements including need for providers to be licensed and use the same standard of care used for in-person patients for reimbursements from Medicaid for, to private insurers. In fact, rather than document and report a D9995 or a D9996 for insurance purposes, there will be a CDT code as long as a dentist oversees a teledentistry event and is involved in the diagnosis and treatment planning process, making the oral evaluation by a dentist per policy of the ADA. It makes sense to have a CDT code to bring us to a complete circle of treating patients and getting reimbursed. Currently, 48 states and the District of Columbia provide some form of Medicaid reimbursement for telehealth services, and many of those are now requiring private insurance plans to cover the procedure. California and Arizona began covering teledentistry in 2015. California classifies telehealth visits as a means of alternative access standards. Other states, including West Virginia, Hawaii, Oregon, and Colorado, are considering passing legislation to allow teledentistry. The Kentucky State Board of Dentistry in 2014 discussed the issues and formed a committee from neighboring dental schools to pursue teledentistry. Arkansas's policy set requirements establishing a professional relationship via telemedicine and addressed providing telehealth services to a minor in a school setting. Illinois policy specifies the need for providers to be licensed using the same standard of care used for in-person visits. 
Texas defines a patient-provider relationship for telemedicine services. Washington further defined where a patient may receive health services to include the originating site of any location determined by the individual receiving the service. So you can see states are certainly embracing the concept of teledentistry in one form or another. The Center of Health Workforce Studies at the Oral Health Workforce Research Center at the University of Albany published case studies of six teledentistry programs, strategies to increase access to general and specialty dental services in, two, in December 2016. Other telecommunication models were also reviewed. The Alaska Dental Health Aid Therapist Training Program and nearly all health care providers in Alaska's tribal health system use telehealth technology provided by the Alaska Federal Health Care Access Network. The Apple Tree Dental in Minnesota links dental hygienists working under collaborative agreements with dentists. The Northern Arizona University Department of Dental Hygiene developed the teledentistry assisted affiliated practice where a dental hygiene model places a dental hygienist in the role of a mid-level practitioner as part of a digitally linked oral health care team as another model using applicable approach to dental teledentistry. The Pacific Center for Special Care at the University of Pacific Dugani School of Dentistry created a virtual dental home complete with a collapsible dental chair, laptop computer, digital camera, supplies to do temporary feelings, and an internet-based dental record system, and a handheld x-ray machine where registered dental hygienists are considered in an alternative practice and as registered dental hygienists working in public health programs and registered dental assistants provide care to underserved populations in schools, nursing homes, community centers, and Head Start centers. There are two specific New York models to learn from. The Finger Lakes Community Health Center had healthcare coordinators use live video for dentists to Skype into primary care settings to provide oral health consultations in rural areas. At the NYU Lutheran Dental Center, dental residents could visit the federally qualified health centers and present patient cases to dental faculty via live video services. In 2015, a New York law was passed allowing dental offices to be considered originating sites for teledentistry, determined from a rural dentistry pilot program with the University of Buffalo. Other accepted originating sites were the nursing home facilities, school-based programs, hospitals, especially the rural ones, various community settings, rural health clinics, physician offices, residency programs, healthcare venues, community hospitals, academic medical centers, internationally linked hospitals, prisons, and disaster zones. So teledentistry extends care to the underserved patient populations at reasonable costs, supplements traditional teaching methods, and provides new opportunities for dental students and dentists. Teledentistry combines telecommunication technology and dental care for increased access to care and advanced dental education. Using technology, professionals can screen, record, triage, diagnose, and order care to be performed remotely. There are several categories applicable to education. Self-education can focus on the use of the Internet. Searching the web educationally for information might expose ideas that will ultimately help a patient. It can, be a, it can be considered a form of distance learning. In addition, interactive video conferencing provides the ability for immediate feedback and is a big benefit for distant learning experiences. In addition, teledentistry provides an opportunity to supplement traditional teaching methods in dental education, offering new opportunities for dental students and dentists in continuing education programs. Relative to the purposes of teledentistry, focus is certainly on senior living facilities, nursing homes, and rural communities, and elementary schools. Teledentistry service providers are supporting this concept. Denteractive, a service provider, reported 64% of patients are comfortable talking to their doctor through video conferencing. In addition, 63% of patients have a higher confidence in a diagnosis from a video call rather than an email or a phone call. Think about how long it takes to give post-op instructions to a patient in an office or teach them 
how to floss or brush. It takes about 8 to 10 minutes. What if those instructions were offered on a tablet like an iPad or some other type of technology instrument? The time saved in an office times the number of patients involved adds up rather significantly, and that's a revenue changer. The younger patients like it, and so do half of the older patients. Teledent, by Mouthwatch System, another system provider, converted teledentistry evaluations into in-office treatments when needed as a benefit. There is an increased visibility for a dentist who provides teledentistry care in their communities and an increase of revenue. The teledentist service is a dental consultation and referral system which provides a virtual dentist wherever and whenever needed. Emergency rooms, urgent care centers, and others have a dentist available 24-7-365 by subscribing to that service. Senior living facilities benefit from reduced efforts and cost of getting dental exams and are provided the right treatment. Nursing homes benefit by having hygienists with written agreements with dentists, referred to as collaborative agreements, ensure that their residents may get services needed as their abilities and medications change. Rural communities, often more often than not, lack easy access to care. Teledentistry helps close the gap of travel and cost to examine and screen patients, provide urgent care, consult dental problems, and teach oral care and have follow-up treatments. It also provides increased specialist care. It improves the lives of low-income families by providing remote examinations and some treatments where dental care is usually not to be carried out. Oral health is one of the leading causes of chronic school absenteeism due to chronic pain related to eating and sleeping. Teledentistry focuses on preventative care, reducing the ER visits and urgent dental emergencies for children. Hygienists are sent into schools and can provide, provide preventative care and carry out simple dental procedures. They can create a dental clinic atmosphere and offer many of the treatments available in a dental practice. By making preventative care and basic treatment accessible in schools, teledentistry removes a significant barrier to good attendance and academic success. There is also a secondary focus for teledentistry that you have to be made aware of, and that's the dental profession in itself. The role of, tel of teledentistry affects every phase of dentistry. Oral medicine and diagnosis, there's an effective alternative in diagnosis and oral lesions. In oral maxillofacial surgery, there's diagnostic assessment of clinical diagnosis of impacted third molars and assessing patients for dental alveolar surgeries. In endodontics, there is a remote help in identifying root canal orifices and periapical lesions. In orthodontics, there is supervised interceptive orthodontic treatment remotely. In prosthodontics, video conferencing for diagnosis and treatment planning for oral health rehabilitation in sparsely populated areas. In periodontics, there is a follow-up care for distant care or suture removal under telesupervision for mobile societies. In pediatric and preventative dentistry, there is a visual, visual examinations for caries detection in young children and screening high-risk preschool children in inner-city child care centers. It's a non-invasive telephotography. So I've talked today a lot about the concepts and purposes of teledentistry, but how is it done? The methodologies take place in three basic ways, real-time, store forward, and remote monitoring. In real-time method, it's also referred to as being synchronous and is real-time consultation live video. It's a two-way interaction between a patient and a provider using audiovisual technology. It is a video conference in which dental professionals see, hear, and communicate with patients using advanced telecommunication technology and ultra-high bandwidth network communications. This method will have its own CDT code. The store and forward method is also referred to as being asynchronous. It is recorded health information including documents and images transmitted through secure electronic communication systems. The information is stored by a practitioner and later forwarded for review by another dentist or specialist prior to future consultation and treatment planning. It is used to evaluate a patient's condition or render a surface outside the real-time or live interaction. These data can then be shared among multiple providers. Patients are not present for this method, 
which it too will have its own CDT code. Remote patient monitoring method is the third method when it involves a distant monitoring of patients, such as those who might be hospitalized, home-based patients. There is a collecting of patient information in one location and transmitted electronically to another practitioner in a different location for use in care and related support care. Telehealth also benefits patients who have been displaced by natural disasters or require constant monitoring. Remote monitoring is a form of real-time and store-forward methods. Mobile health, called mHealth, has recently been recognized in healthcare and public health practice and education and is supported by mobile communication devices such as cell phones, tablets, and personal digital assistants. It has been shown that tablets are very effective for certain populations like senior citizens in explaining and as reminders of postoperative care and use of postoperative medications. The Internet is the basis of modern systems of teledentistry. It has to be up to date, fast, and able to transport large amounts of data in short periods of time. In order to be involved in the telehealth process, a dentist must have special equipment, just like each specialist needs specifics to his or her practice. A desktop laptop or laptop computer, and it should include a microphone. There should be a substantial hard drive and random access memory and a speedy processor. A comprehensive software program capable of image acquisition and storage and transmission of gathered information. A digital camera, video camera, interoral camera, and portable x-ray units are also needed. The ability to code and decode audio and video is desirable. A modern fax machine, a, mod, a modem, a fax machine, scanner and printer may also be necessary. Quick, reliable connection to the Internet is essential. Consider a widely available standalone IP video conferencing solution or PCI codec board into your system, which enhances video conferencing. The te technological pathways are essentially having a patient with a provider at one geographic location, venue A, and the dental provider or web consultant at distant location, venue B. The dentist in venue B obtains the information from cloud-based software to provide a diagnosis of the patient's needs. The patients receive a consultation with the dentist through the web consultant, the patient portal, and or a phone call. Telehealth technology allows for the medical histories and dental images to be up uploaded to a website where a dentist reviews them and creates a treatment plan or refers patients requiring more complex treatment to a dentist in their area. The methods real-time, store and forward, or remote are utilized via the Internet cloud, and all information is transmitted telephonically. Teledentistry can also be between dentists in two locations, one seeking the advice for diagnostic or treatment pur purposes, as I stated early on. In the senior living facilities, rural areas, nursing homes, and primary schools, there is usually a collaborative practice where as a dental hygienist has an agreement with a dentist or multiple dentists. This is known as the Dental Hygiene Collaborative Practice, which originated in New Mexico in 1999, inspired by the nursing model of a collaborative practice. Today, it allows for direct access to patients by the registered dental hygienist who may see, evaluate, and provide certain treatments to patients without the prior examination or authorization of the dentist. The dentist still has involvement based on the terms of an agreement. The basic elements of a collaborative practice agreement between the registered dental hygienist and a dentist that typically includes the following, a protocol governing the circumstances in which the registered dental hygienist can initiate treatment, description of allowed services, practice protocols, the responsibilities of a collaborating dentist concerning consultation with a registered dental hygienist, recording maintenance, emergency management plan, and referral procedures. Through the collaboration, however, the patient's needs and situations can be transmitted to the dentist who will screen, diagnose, evaluate care provided, and prescribe care to be performed. And then, in return, instructions for the treatment are relayed to the hygienist. The degree of treatment is dependent on the scope of practice allowed 
in whatever state the event is taking place. Dental hygienists can provide all the necessary preventative services, such as dental cleanings, x-rays, sealants, and fluoride varnishes. Portable equipment allows the hygienist to create a treatment room in essentially any location by using an intraoral camera to capture an up-close and personal view of the overall condi condition of health of the hard and soft tissues and tooth structures. Five states, Alaska, Arkansas, Minnesota, New York, and, and Mexico, actually call it a collaborative, New Mexico, actually call it a collaborative practice. Other states have a variety of names, such as affiliated practice, public health dental hygienist, extended care permit, or something else. They all essentially mean the same thing and do the same. One legitimate concern is that of confidentiality. When sensitive patient identifiable data is transferred electronically and stored in computers, we must take extraordinary, extraordinary care to protect the patient privacy and make sure as best humanly possible not to have the data compromised. All HIPAA regulations must be adhered to. Data should be sent encrypted to an off-site location. Patients must be made aware of the process and should sign an informed consent document to memorialize the informative information you will have with them. Informed consent in teledentistry should cover everything that exists in a standard traditional consent discussion and form. Included should be the discussion of the risk of improper diagnosis or treatment due to potential fa failure of technology involved. Having said that, follow the measure twice and cut once philosophy. Review carefully what you are sending or receiving and ask questions before embarking on reasonable recommendation for treatment. In addition, medical, legal, and copyright issues are also have to be considered, more so because of the lack of well-defined standards. Privacy and security reimbursement issues exist, but there are no methods in place to ensure quality, safety, efficiency, or effectiveness of information in its, in its exchange, according to the extensive review of teledentistry in 2011 by Jim Pani et al. Legal issues include, but are not limited to, licensure, jurisdiction, and malpractice. As of now, teledentistry licensure does not exist, and therefore full licensure is needed in each state in which one desires to participate in this new alternative method of dental practice. Having said that, barriers other than what I've stated do exist. The most significant barrier to nationwide implementation of teledentistry is the traditional system of state-by-state -state licensure. Most states have some form of regulation governing teledentistry, and there are no exemptions for out-of-state teledentistry consultants. States must have legislation supporting teledentistry. Dentists and allied dental personnel must be licensed or credentialed in accordance with the laws of the state in which the patient receives care, and all allied dental personnel participating in teledentistry must have supervision conforming to the Dental Practice Act in the state where the patient is receiving services and where the dentist is licensed. There are no laws to clarify the role of the telepractitioner and his or her liability. Slow, confusing legal and regulatory landscapes certainly exist. The startup costs and connection fees, the cost of the telecommunication equipment is also daunting. Availability for broadband or other Internet connection may be difficult. However, in today's technology, it's become easier to obtain. There is a need for training and workforce development to be as precise as one would be in the brick-and-mortar environment. And as I stated, everything must be HIPAA compliant. There are ethical considerations and, of course, confidentiality, transferring medical histories and records as well as protecting the patient privacy from unauthorized entities. There are security issues of electronically stored information. There could be issues and risk of joining third-party referral services. An out-of-state dentist reading scans without a state license where the patient is may not be protected from malpractice if there's a claim of alleged misdiagnosis. Professionals are held responsible for the care provided for the residents of the state of the treatment, and you have to be aware of the unintended doctor-patient relationship which may develop or implied by the reliance factor. But there are obvious benefits, including all that I've discussed throughout this webinar, and include but are not limited to increasing access to care with less travel involved, supporting improved continuity 
of care and case management and by allowing conducting oral health assessments by interactive video conferencing for the evaluation of patient information with or without the patient being present, assisting the determination for treatment needs. Teledentistry educates patients about treatment options and makes recommendations of appropriate referrals. Teledentistry can provide the critical services where gaps currently exist, especially for treatment planning and specialty consultations. Teledentistry may also allow oral health professionals to evaluate and meet the oral needs of children at school and child care centers. Teledentistry can facilitate great, greater use of non-dentist providers, an alternative for hygienists or mid-level providers to practice outside the traditional dental operatory by the collaborative practice and improved early diagnosis and treatment outcomes of oral disease. Telehealth provides a unique way to overcome the barriers of geography to, develop, to, to deliver patient care, as well as hands-on training and continuing education to oral health professionals in remote clinics. Utilizing current technologies, affiliated practice dental hygienists can digitally acquire and transmit diagnostic data to a distant dentist for triage, diagnosis, and patient referral, in addition to providing preventative services permitted within the dental hygiene scope of practice of each state. Telehealth technology allows for the medical histories and dental images to be uploaded to a website where a dentist reviews them and creates a treatment plan or refers patients requiring more complex treatment to a dentist in their area. This is a welcome procedure for second opinions, pre-authorizations, and other insurance requirements, which can be met almost instantaneously online. Educational services at academic institution benefits and promotes purposeful interaction between educators and students within dental and dental hygiene schools. Because teledentistry can only be practiced within a specific state border, it does not require dental acts to comply with other states philosophically. In summary, because teledentistry provides a unique way to overcome the barriers of, ge of geography to deliver patient care, as well as hands-on training and continuing education to oral health professionals in remote clinics, senior living facilities, schools, nursing facilities, and hospitals, it is our responsibility to help guide our legislative personnel and state boards to recognize the importance of true portability and to accept one method for a national license for us to treat patients across state borders. Occupational licensure is being examined in every state, but it appears that dentistry is not being included in this, in this, this, this discussion just yet. Thank you all for participating in the AADB webinar. Uh, if there are questions, please address them to uh, Donna, as was stated early on in this uh, presentation, and your questions will be answered accordingly. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Bruce. Do, <clears throat> this is Dick Hetke again. Um, do we have any questions that have been submitted, um, Bruce, that you've received? Uh, I, it's, I have one here. I think we, uh, Bruce. I think we've got one coming in right now. I sent it to you. Uh, uh, Donna just sent it on to you right now. So you want to check your screen? I know you've just finished your presentation, but Donna, okay, we one. have one from Mary Brown. You want to read the question then, Bruce? Yep, I'm looking for it. It just came on. Um, It is from, there's a question from uh, <clears throat> Mr. Larry Brown, Executive Director of the Kentucky Board of Dentistry. Uh, and if I, he may be a doctor, I don't know. Uh, with artificial intelligence and robotics, advancing technologies of 3D and other technologies, allowing telehealth in greater scope, what suggestions does Dr. Cybrick see for writing regulations that do not inhibit, prohibit, or prevent these new businesses business models and technologies to develop. And the second question was the elimination of state licensure creates legal hardships on each state's citizens to seek relief for inappropriate or standard of care because of state's courts positions of standing and other issues. Does it therefore become a federal court case? The expense 
to state citizens as a barrier to relief using national telehealth licensing. The open border type of reciprocity is the answer with minimum registration for each dentist provider to allow citizens to seek relief within the state. A national standard of care and scope of practice is also needed. The Kentucky Board of Dentistry is finalizing telehealth regulations for submission later on this year for approval. Um, yes, I read that with the uh, Kentucky Board of uh, Dentistry who uh, joined up with the uh, neighboring dental schools to uh, form a committee and um, examine the telehealth uh, regulations and uh, uh, go forward, and I congratulate them for doing that. Um, does the want to go, want to go back to the first question, members? And yeah. The, the elimination of the state of, license, uh, of state licensure creates legal hardships for each state in, state's citizens to seek relief for inappropriate standard of care. I don't think so. I, I think if there's a national licensure, uh, I think that will all be uh, the insurance companies. I think you're talking about malpractice issues and so on, uh, negligence. That all would, uh, would come within the insurance industry and changes would be made uh, to accommodate that. I, I, I don't see that as a, as a real issue. I don't see uh, uh, any added expense to state citizens as a barrier uh, using uh, this type of thing. Um, the question of artificial intelligence and robotics, advancing technologies of 3D, um, I, I think the communities have, of interest have to come together to sit down and, and write the regulations, uh, and I, I, it, I think it's a collaborative uh, uh, effort for everybody to uh, uh, get the right wording uh, the first time so that they are not uh, inhibiting or prohibiting uh, uh, business models to develop. I think when these... Uh, there will be business models developing, such as the service providers, and I, I think uh, I, I believe all the concerns will be taken into consideration appropriately. Is there another question, Donna? That I, I think those were the only ones that were submitted. Got another okay. one. We've, got a, we've got another one coming in, Bruce, so just hold on. Uh, it, there may be some delay, but Don has pushed the button. It should be there momentarily. <laughs> Keep an eye on your screen. My eyes on the screen. All right. And it's not come through yet. No, it is not coming through. front of you, Dick, by chance? I'll get it from Donna. Uh, Bruce, do you, I have it right now. I can read it to you. Okay. It has not come through on the screen. This is from, from Jill Stecker from Iowa, and I know Jill. She's been a number of AADB events, and she says she actually is requesting you to, to talk, if you can, about ITR, the Interim Therapeutic Restoration, and its possible role in teledentistry. So can you talk about ITR, Interim Therapeutic Restoration, and its possible role in teledentistry? I am not that familiar with that, other, other than the, to say that the for an interim uh, restoration, is that what they're referring to? On the yes. I, okay. Um, certainly is, uh, would be for uh, a, a stopgap method for uh, pain relief uh, with caries. Um, it would uh, eliminate uh, some emergency room visits. Uh, I think it would be... Uh, I think it has a role in total dentistry and in the settings that uh, that I mentioned throughout the uh, lecture. In the uh, senior uh, resident, uh, senior citizen residences, the nursing homes, at schools, and so on, uh, I think it certainly has a uh, uh, a place. 
Well, thank you, Bruce. I think that should do it now for the questions. Those were very good questions, obviously, and uh, thanks, Bruce, for, for your response. I um, want to thank you uh, for, for the presentation, Bruce. I want to thank all the audience for, for dialing in. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the program. Uh, we'd invite you to look forward to the upcoming teleseminars. As I said, we're going to do probably three more in the course of the year. I think we're planning one for June, one for September, and one for December. And uh, we'd invite all the listeners, if you have topics that you think would be good candidates for teleseminars, please email them to Donna Adler, same email address, dadler at dentalboards.org. Uh, we've got a couple of topics right now currently on the, on the, on the uh, table but we're looking for a couple more good good program topics for the rest of the year. So that's about it. Uh, this is Dick Hetke from AADB. Uh, we're going to sign off right now. Thanks again for, for joining us, and we look forward to your dialing in for another program um, in, in May. Thanks a lot, everybody. Signing off. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks.